be introducing first Elizabeth Churchill from eBay Research, and then John Kleinberg from Cornell. They're going to each talk for five or so minutes with some slides, or perhaps a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll talk fast. If only we could crowdsource a cut signal. That's um, right. And then, we should um, give you paddles. Then we'll talk on stage and take some questions. So with no further ado, Elizabeth. Thanks. Thanks so much. So I have a, a few slides, and I'm just going to go through very quickly. Um, but if I lose anybody, let me know. And so the end point, in case I get stopped, is that I think this is so exciting, and I'm so excited to be here, um, because we are in very exciting times, and we're only at the beginning um, of a truly scientific data science. And I think a few of the folks in the panel a minute ago just said that. Um, I'm going to give you my context. Um, personalization was also mentioned. And I am really interested in actually putting the person into personalization. Um, and I'm really interested in designing better services. So I'm just being upfront with you about what I care about. I work for eBay. Um, I used to work for Yahoo. I've been working in the internet industry. And I really care about designing better services. That's my goal. It's out there. Um, I borrowed this term from Paul Durish um, uh, at uh, UC Irvine, um, uh, this notion of algorithmic living. We live in algorithmic times. And um, I care about this top level of the lovely humans, us, and all of the messiness of our lives. Um, I'm involved in designing interfaces. Uh, Kate Crawford yesterday talked about um, Anne, Anne Galloway's work on interfaces and thinking about interfaces as brokering a conversation between people and algorithms. We gather data, that's what we're talking about here. And then we do a lot of algorithmic work. And this is a kind of like old systems science view of the world. I hope some of you recognize that. But I think that if we only stick at one level and don't understand that these are interacting and it's a very complex set of systems and that system science is a set of understanding the complexities of interaction, then we kind of get lost. So one of my manifestos is really to get designers more involved with designing data and data scientists more involved with designers in understanding how the interactions at the interface generate the data that we collect. We do data shaping. We do data design. Um, yesterday, Kate reminded us in her keynote a lot about the macro and meta levels of you know, how data get designed all the way from regulations through business metrics, down to organizations and what they believe that their metrics are, through teams and how their metrics matter to their success. And the interfaces and the people are right here at the end of that, being influenced and influencing all those processes. So I really work at the micro level. I work at other levels too, but for the purposes of today at the micro level. I am a psychologist. I'm on the side, on the side, I'm interested in humans, that's what I care about, so you're always going to hear me coming back to that. Humans are really complex, they're really interesting, we care about physiology, um, we, we, we're full of you know, the perception, cognition, these are all things that could be measured and data could be gathered. Things that are less tangible in some ways, like emotion, I'm very interested in emotion, and people's emotions. And I'm talking specifically about their interactions um, with the services that we have, not necessarily their emotions about privacy, for example. I want to put that on the side. But just for the moment, I want to pretend that the world is not full of concerns about privacy. Of course we are, but I don't, don't talk about that here. Um, trust, Koi Cheshire was somewhere. Really, really important to think about trust in general at the interaction in the interface. Um, John's going to talk more about kind of networks. Um, the context that we're in, the last panel, we also heard about this. The context, you know, the, what you do with a service, what you're doing in your interaction, isn't just this interface. It's also the whole of the physical situation you're in. Is your baby crying? You know, how does that distract what you do? We are embodied creatures, you know, in space, in social contexts. Um, and so I've been really interested in thinking about this notion of experience mining, understanding people and designing services from click logs from the data that we can get at that level of granularity, behavioral and transactional data. I'm going to give you an example. Another word, personalization, I said, engagement and churn are other words that I think about a lot. Looking at the click data. So I put this up because I thought human engagement, you know, do you love me? Yes. Will you marry me? Yes. Internet engagement, do you love us? New feature. 
Do you love us now? <laughs> Do you love us? <laughs> Do you love us now? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and that's what my world feels like a lot. And so true data science has to triangulate. Experience mining is never going to be enough with these sorts of data. There's many kinds of data, experimental data, um, ethnographic data, interview-based data. These need to be triangulated to truly understand. I'll give you one last example, and then I'm going to get off. How many people have been on a dating site? Thank goodness. So, most people don't admit it, but there's always a few. <laughs> <laughs> and statistically, it's like a low number, really. Yeah. So not just from the, the, the click data. The click data are generated by the interactions in the interface. And I just want, how many of you filled out a form like this even if it wasn't actually on a dating site? Right, yeah. And like, I really don't know, you know, am I a social butterfly or am I a homebody? I don't know. And, you know, on the other side of it, designer, experimental, I'm sitting, remember, through my keyhole, looking at the click, click, click. And I'm like, you're lying when you change from being skinny to athletic. I'm not lying as the interaction person. I am actually just trying to describe myself in these weird predetermined terms where you've already predetermined what the categories are that I can choose. Are you defining me or am I defining you? And it's absolutely remarkable that a disproportionate number of people are born on January the 1st. Because it's the top of the drop-down menu. Um, so if we really wanted to understand dating as opposed to matching and as opposed to training our people to fill in the form so that our algorithms be work better, so that we could give them stuff and then they moderate their behavior and train us, this co-training that's happening. Um, choosing a date is really like, or going on a date, it's really an emotional journey that's very complicated and those forms only really deal with this bit. Um, there's a whole bit of planning the date and going out and doing other stuff and then being profoundly disappointed and leaving. Um, or meeting your love, really. And that emotional journey where it's not just transactions and behaviors in the limit of what the service defines, but beyond the limit of that is what's going to take us from engagement in the interface to what's called customer lifetime value, deep trust, and really building services for people who actually you've collaborated with, essentially. So um, I'm going to get off in a second. D data aware design, design aware data. The interface brokers a conversation, and the interface isn't just this interface. It's the merchandising, you know, not just the screen, it's the merchandising and the packaging and all of the rest of it. It affords actions. Proactive data collection versus reactive data analytics is really important, and that's why we, we need to, this is from Kate, it's too much focus on the numbers and not on the insights. We need to not just have artifactual collections, we need intentional programmatic collection. We want to assume tangible and intangible signals. We want to worry about weak signals, partial footprints, composite persons. How many people share an account with someone? Right? A lot of people share accounts. Um, bots. Yesterday, Kate talked about bots generating data. I hadn't even, for some reason, thought of that. Um, misleading information. You know, um, maybe, maybe I'm actually not athletic, and I've told you I am, um, because I want to be aspirational. Missing pieces, incomplete stories. So the questions we have to ask ourselves, which is why the data sciences are at the beginning, it's so exciting right now, is what are you asking? Or what do you want to know about person and why? What is the design rationale for your instrumentation? Are the data you are gathering fit for your purpose? Are they valid? Are they reliable? And are your conclusions justified? These are the questions that we ask ourselves as scientists. And we're getting there, but we're not there. So... Not everything that can be counted, counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Somebody said that was Einstein, I'm not sure. It seems to be controversial. But we really are truly at the beginning, um, and that's what I'm hoping that we will have a, a, a seed of a conversation today. And now I'm going to get John. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. They're not telling their age correctly. Go ahead. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hey, great. Great. Thanks a lot. You mic'd up? Uh, I am waked up, and then this thing is not uh, displaying. Actually, do we know why it's not displaying? Oh. Uh, it's mirroring. Do you want to mirror the projectors? You know how to do that? Yes, you do, don't you? Uh, if I find your system preferences, I can mirror them. Displays, mirror. Arrangement, mirror. All right. 
It's always the fun part where you get to display your knowledge of the Mac desktop in front of everybody. And uh, there it is. Okay. So uh, thanks very much. So um, so thanks very much for uh, inviting me to take part in this. It's been a, <coughs> a really um, a fascinating uh, set of talks yesterday and, and this morning. So um, I want to follow up on what Elizabeth was talking about um, with actually just to try to lay out a, a couple of stories of cases where we've looked at data being generated by humans, some of the things we found, and some of the cases where what, what, what you're measuring you have to be careful about. You have to be careful where it came from and how you're interpreting it. Um, when Elizabeth and I were talking uh, with Quentin yesterday afternoon, there was this question, uh, I liked Elizabeth's taxonomy of micro versus meso versus macro, and I somehow think of myself as researching at the macro level, because I'm thinking about big populations, but in fact, if you think about it more closely, it's really about not taking what's normally stated as macro, right? Not, not taking the institutions that we normally think of as macro, but trying to induce the macro from the micro, right? And so, if I think about it, and if I think about how the, the evolution of online information has worked, it's really been this steady progression over 20 years from the library, right? The metaphor of the web as the vast universal library in 1994, to the metaphor of the crowd, right? This thing that's real-time, dynamic, transient, and reacts as things come, and reacts in very bite-sized pieces, right? So the information passes in these bite-sized pieces. And to really understand something now, to understand experience online is to share it with tens of millions of people and to have to actually induce the collective experience from those tens of millions of different fragmented perspectives. That's a very new kind of thing that we've had to do, right? It's not the top down that there were three people there who recorded their perceptions of it and that's now what we have, but it's really tens of millions of people did that. And so I wanted to give you a, a couple of examples of where you, where you might try to induce things from this, this sort of crowd. Starting with something that um, harks back to Kate's talk yesterday, she was talking about tweets from Hurricane Sandy, and people looked at um, tweets from the Northern Virginia earthquake in, in 2011. And it, if you trace that back, this, this is actually something that um, has been sort of in the air for a while. We thought about this in 2007. Uh, 2007, we were looking at search engine query logs at uh, Yahoo, and I was doing this with my then student, Lars Backstrom, uh, with Ravi Kumar and Jasmine Novak at Yahoo Research. And the, the big hurricane of the 2007 season was Hurricane Dean. The name got retired afterwards because it was so intense. And it basically moved across the Central Caribbean and made landfall in Mexico. And we thought, people are querying all over the world for Hurricane Dean as it's, as it's coming. And, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually try to track the storm from this, right? And as far as I know, this was, this was sort of the first of the kind of storm tracking adventures from on online data. This was 2007. There was Twitter at that point was about five months old, and so there, there were no real tweets about this, but there was a lot of search engine traffic. And we thought, let's just take all those, all those search engine queries for Hurricane Dean, and hopefully they describe sort of an approximate circle, and we'll fit the center of that circle, and we'll see, does that actually, you know, in any sense, track the storm? And to our surprise, it actually kind of, the, quer the center, right, so we have all these dots for all the queries, and we fit a center, and it actually moved with the center of the storm uh, as that storm made landfall. And so on the one hand, we felt like this is kind of cool because there's something that's indisputably real going on in the world, right? Hurricane Dean was actually happening. It was not some kind of just figment of our collective online consciousness. And yet that real thing could actually be somehow estimated from what's going on online, up to a point, right? Because in the end, you always have to remember what is it you're measuring and what is it that's being left out. And we were not tracking the storm and we weren't even tracking the set of people being affected by the storm. We were, we were tracking the world's attention to the storm. And so if, if, if you look at the yellow line, which was our best fit to the center of the queries, it tracks it pretty well while it's out in the ocean and while the people who are querying it are also the ones who are sort of affected by it. And then at some point it takes this sharp right turn and starts heading north, right? Why is that? Well, because if you looked a little bit at it, this is roughly the moment when the news media in North America woke up to the story. Right, Hurricane D is approaching land, and there's so much more mass up there than down here that now we start to fit our circle, and it begins drifting this way because everybody has started to actually notice it. Right, so there's actually on the online world you can actually have a discrete change. One morning, news agencies decide to cover it, and there's, the thing actually makes a right turn. The storm, of course, doesn't make a right turn. It's oblivious to all the media attention being lavished on it. It just plows into Mexico. <laughs> but this is the, this is the sort of thing that you have to remember about. Right, you always have to remember what, what is it you're measuring. Part of it you can, just, you, you can just nail, right? This real thing we tracked it, but part of it is going to be a reflection of something else. Something else interesting. It's interesting to know when people started paying attention to it in North America. But it was that thing and not, not just the storm. 
A second place where we've looked at this, um, I, I want to put a, 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 a picture of a network because we've been talking about them. One useful way that we've found to think about uh, the experience of people in social networks is not just to think about the giant, say, Facebook friend graph, right? One billion nodes, because a network on one billion nodes is in every real sense incomprehensible to human beings. We can't really think about it. And so one thing that's often easier is to imagine that network instead as, again, a collection of millions, or in this case, a billion things. Each person's network neighborhood, right? Take you, take all of your friends, and take the connections among them, okay? I'm not sure if any of you have visualized your own friend neighborhood, but they all look sort of similar, and they all look kind of like this, okay? This is one person's friend neighborhood. This is actually a there's a, a nice visualization done by um, uh, Cameron Marlowe, Tom Lento, Edenmar Rosen, and Lee Byron at Facebook. Actually, I guess Eden is going to be talking later on this morning. Um, and this was uh, data they got from uh, a Facebook en engineer, a colleague of theirs, who had sort of donated his network to science so that you know it could be studied like this. <laughs> and right, so dots are, are are the friends of this this. This guy and the links are friends. And you can learn a lot about someone's life from looking at this kind of thing, right? I mean, let's just sort of talk it through. Right? There's a big cluster up there, a big cluster over there. These two clusters don't talk to each other. So, very clearly, two different parts of this person's life, right? Um, and and those two parts don't really interact. So they're presumably from two different phases of their life, right? And then there's other stuff, right? Somewhere in here is probably their extended family because people's extended family on Facebook are usually neither that big nor that big. So it's probably somewhere down here. And then there's people who sort of defy classification and span, span different clusters. In a sense, looking at these kind of network neighborhoods is almost kind of a modern form of palm reading, right? I'm looking at these lines, and, and I actually find myself doing this. I say, oh, I see you have a strong line here. This means you, you, know, you work at the same company as your best friend. It means you live in a land far from your family. It means you went to college close to home. All these things actually, if you look at a lot of these, start to show up, right? Now, there are a number of interesting questions here, right? Because again, we're assembling collective experience from these fragments. This is one fragment. This is one person's friend network. Um, a couple of questions we could ask. One is, which is the real network? I've said sort of down in this forest of chairs down here, I've drawn some questions, but I'll, I can say them to you. Um, so which is the real, this is a network. This is who the declared friendships. But is that the one we want to look at? How about if we only look at, at links where there was a communication sometime in the past month? Then we get that network, right? That network thins out a lot. Some of it remains, some of it doesn't, right? So it's quite different from that network. Which is the real network? Well, they're all the real network, right? It depends what we're using this for. Are we looking for friendships you've expressed and that in your mind they're real friendships or the ones where you've kept in touch? Right? And the fact they differentially thin out, if you wanted to guess which of those two clusters is their coworkers, which is the old friends from school, it's easy. One of those is very active, one of those isn't, right? So that one on the right there, they're all friends, but you know, they don't talk very much and, and that's fine. They've been friends for a long time and you hear about them occasionally when they change jobs or get engaged or have a baby. Um, and of course, what you see here, so, um, my uh, student, Lars Backstrom, after building that beautiful visualization of, of the hurricane and doing a whole bunch of other uh, cool stuff in his PhD work, um, moved to Facebook where um, he's uh, the manager of the newsfeed ranking team. One thing he did was to um, build the current friend recommender, right? So the people you may know, you click accept or not, which had an enormous impact on friending activity, right? Because when you join Facebook, you sort of look around and you say, you know, you, you do the human version of, hey, where is everybody? Hello, right, as, as Liz was saying. Because, you know, you're, you're told your friends are there, but where are they? They start getting recommended to you based on heuristics that look at the graph and say, well, you have many mutual friends with this person, and so maybe you know them. M many of your friends have recently friended this person. Maybe you know them. And so a lot of this network is actually created because it was recommended to people. And that's necessary. It gets you on board. But it's, a, it's also a little circular because we had a theory about what we think networks look like. We implement that theory in a machine learning algorithm that makes recommendations. You accept those recommendations, and the network now, to some extent, confirms our theory because we built it into the recommender. And I'm not saying that, cir that circularity is good or bad. It's, in a sense, necessary for people to become engaged with the product, but it's there. And so sometimes what you're studying is what you actually built into the system in subtle ways. And we need to also think about that in the way the data comes from. All right, and I had one more slide, and actually I only put this slide in because in the previous panel, um, when the panelists were pressed to think of, uh, actually I guess when Douglas Merrill was pressed to think of an example of a piece of data that would be absolutely useless to everyone, he gave the example of people crossing their leg, one leg over one knee, and I thought, hey, we have a paper on that, so I'll mention it. <laughs> um, and so sometimes there are signals that are very hard for you to control, and maybe those signals are more revealing and maybe they aren't, but let me show you sort of the tip of the iceberg on this. This is the phenomenon of 
social coordination or accommodation, which we were studying at the language level. So let me tell you what language coordination is, then I'll get back to leg, crossing one leg over one knee. Here's how language coordination works. So this is uh, my two colleagues, uh, Christian Donescu, Nicolas Gamizel, and William Lee, actually did this um, one day so with scripts from movies where they showed that he, even synthetic dialogue has this effect. So this is the 1970 movie The Getaway. That's Steve McQueen, that's Ally McGraw. Steve McQueen says, at least you're outside, and Ally McGraw says it doesn't make much difference. Uh, a pair of lines, you could have picked hundreds of these examples. What I, what I want to ask is, he says a quantifier, a quantity word, least, and she parrots back a quantity word, much, right? And she could have said a lot of things. She could have said it doesn't really matter, it's not important, but no, she said it doesn't make much difference. Now, any one of those is, of course, maybe it's just coincidence, right? But if, if, if you aggregate over many, many pairs of utterances, in fact, you do echo the word choices of the people you're talking to. If you talk to someone and they use a lot of prepositions, you will actually increase the rate at which you use prepositions or conjunctions or articles. This simply happens. And it's not something any of us even necessarily intuitively believes, but you, know, you measure large amounts of text, and that's actually happening. You're doing this at some kind of subconscious level you know, to coordinate with the person, to accommodate to them, to please them in a sense. right? And this, com this is sort of part of, of a, a very large space in social ecology of social coordination, which includes postural coordination. It actually includes that if you're talking to someone and they put their hand on their chin, you have a tendency to put your hand on your chin, you cross your arms. After a while, the four of us working on this couldn't even hold meetings anymore, because none of us would lean forward and we'd all, you know, no, I'm not gonna do that, right? Now, the funny thing is, this is a low-level signal, and because it somehow feels sort of genuine, it feels very hard to, for someone to control, it can become a marker of certain things. And so, what we're looking for in the language context is that the, our hypothesis was, based on some small-scale lab studies that have been going on, but we had this sort of much larger data set to test it on, that there was actually this kind of asymmetry in coordination, that one person coordinated more to the other, and that might be a sign of power difference, right? If a high-powered person is talking to a low-powered person, the low-powered person has more interest in sort of pleasing the other, and they might coordinate more. And we actually found this in two very different contexts, okay? And just wanted to mention this. Um, one was online, one was very sort of high-stakes offline um, Supreme Court transcript. So the online version was when you get promoted to be an admin on Wikipedia, we found actually your language changes. So this is the amount of the amount to which you're coordinating to others, this is the amount others are coordinating to you in their language. There's no posture on Wikipedia. And this is the moment you got promoted, okay? And when you got promoted, it turns out people begin, after a sort of month of burn-in here, two months out, people begin coordinating you much more and you actually start coordinating much less to people in the area, right? So you can actually see the effect on people's language as they achieve some new position of power. Supreme Court, we looked at three years of transcripts, uh, justices talking to lawyers, and we actually found that Right, so power can also be situational, right? So if you're trying, if you're talking to a justice who's gonna end up voting against you, that's a different relationship from talking to a justice who's gonna end up voting for you. And you actually found that the lawyers were in effect trying harder with the justices who would eventually vote against them. They were coordinating more at this low level, right? Something that was clearly escaping everybody's conscious d detection. And maybe even more intriguingly, um, maybe even more intriguingly, the justices were coordinating more to the lawyers they ended up siding with. Right? There was less of a situational power difference. And so you actually had this sort of very low-level signal. Right? And of course, you know, lawyers go in and they have different plans for what they're going to say to different people. But whether people are consciously controlling their usage of prepositions and conjunctions, I think that's a much harder sell. Right? There's, something, there's a signal they're potentially leaking out on top of all the overt, you know, all the overt choice of language and construction of language that clearly is very clearly going on. Okay, so those were three quick stories just to kind of provide some raw material for the discussion. And, um, I guess, should we Let's move go. on to yeah. talk? Thank you very much. I've got to start by asking Elizabeth, at what age do people start lying about their age on dating sites? <laughs> Am I on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so at what age do they start like not saying what age they are? Um, I don't know that, but I do know that um, the number of people actually lying increases the older they get. Well, for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's an affirmation of... I, I think um, people, men lie less than women about age. Um, but do they lie more outrageously? Do women feather the truth and men just go 10 years <laughs> off? No, I think, no, no. I think uh, it tends to be more feathering. But I think one of the reasons I put that story up was, so, you know, you look at the data, but then you do interviews. So we interviewed a bunch of people and surveyed a bunch of people. It, this was work done with uh, Elizabeth Goodman. Um, who is at Berkeley, at the um, high school. And she was interning with me. 
and you find that people will keep tweaking until they get the results they want, and that's yeah. why there's this sort of co-training that occurs, right? See, this is the this this is the object that knows it's being watched. Absolutely. This is you know the, the data object that is also aware of the process and is Absolutely. gaming it. And as a data designer, it's so interesting. I was writing down, you're actually developing a user interface where you're you know you're soliciting lies in the interest of a greater truth. You know, well, you could almost have a pop-up when they say, I'm 27, you pop up, really? Yes, <laughs> right. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah and I, I think what is, what's interesting is that, you know, when, when you it's basically an algorithmic perspective. We have a bunch of attributes that we want to match. Yeah. And we want to get you people introduced. And so the actual tick boxes that you end up using tend to be the things that the designer developers think are important. The UI shouldn't be determined on truth per se. It should be determined on outcome. What is it they're looking for? Happiness. So if they lie about their age as a means to happiness, that, that was good, bad data, right? Ab absolutely. And I think that you'll find that you know, um, the things that you get to check, you know, someone will come in and say, hey, maybe we should try this. That might be a good predictor that we can make a match. Right. Um, and I think there are a few dating sites more recently where you can actually sort of put up categories yourself, a bit like tagging yourself, although I, I haven't studied those. But, but I think that the designers often are trying to come up with what are the right categories. Right. And what we see are that there are cultural differences. So dating sites in different parts of the world tend to have different kinds of things that you checkbox, and they reflect the cultural assumptions of those places <coughs> as to what are the right criteria for getting people together. I did a story one time on vertical dating sites, oh, yeah. J-Date, places like this. And the guys in the businesses love them because people pay more and stay longer to be on those. Yeah. Because typically when they choose a category like religion or ethnicity or something very personal to them, right. uh, they're looking for a longer term relationship than just a match.com or Yahoo dating or whatever. Right. I think John's last story was very relevant here. Because, you know, in the micro moments, you know, people um, like Adam Kendon and other interactional psychologists have looked at those micro m moments of interaction in great detail. And actually what you're seeing on a lot of dating sites is a sort of co-shaping of what, you know, it's actually quite hard. You go on and you write a profile and then you're like, wait, that profile doesn't quite get enough views. Oh, you're writing to me with that. I'm highlighting this. Oh. So that's why most profiles end up being these incredibly bland things where you know, everybody wants to do soul-searching walks on the beach. Um, everybody has traveled like extensively or wants to travel. So they become these currencies, and we co-shape each other. Um, and, and I think in those vertical dating sites, right. it gets kind of tighter and tighter and tighter. We're sort of defining who we are as a group as well. Right, right. And th what's interesting in some ways is People participating in a networked world are presenting self, and not in any kind of uniform way. It's very contextual. They're present, you know, if an Amazon recommendation comes up, they might even look at different stuff, right? Just to have better books, like smarter seeming books recommended to them, <laughs> just right. to have that like, like splashed back in their face. And it's purely narcissistic. It's not like anybody else is seeing that aside from some algorithm at, at Amazon. Yeah. Although I would say it's also sometimes tra transactional. Like you're sort of thinking, how do I get, you know, I feel like Amazon and I got off to a bad start. It has the wrong impression of me. How do I get <laughs> right. to show me more <laughs> right. stuff? Yeah, know, my kid I, went on and picked a Pokemon book. Yeah, how do I get to show me more? Now it thinks I'm yeah. 10. Right, how do I get to show me more of the kind of stuff I want? Maybe if I select this and this and this, it'll kind of get back to what, it, you know, what I really am. Right, because right, exactly. I really would like <laughs> to hear more about myself yeah. in a better way. Right, yeah. you know, and yeah. this makes, you're making interesting points about UI, actually, because you know, you're soliciting a path to happiness, and that's a very squishy thing, but it, there, are, there are signifiers. Or um, I was thinking in that echoing word choice, there's a great UI implication there. Do I set up language that yeah. echoes them? That's like the old, the old Eliza yeah. machine, but in design itself. Right, exactly. So there's uh, this notion of creating a natural inter interaction. I mean, I think what we're finding hard, you know, and people find this hard in computer graphics, and they find this hard in all these domains, is that the number of signals that we're attuned to, that we're not even aware that we're attuned to, is extremely large, right? And so this, this notion of a sort of unity of sort of 
our intuitive perception of the world, right, that it sort of feels right, is sort of actually us synthesizing many, many low-level signals, right? So I think it's, it's actually very hard to unpack what that kind of common sense or that, that unity of experience is. This is devastating because I'm crossed right leg and she's crossed left leg and you've got both feet on the ground and I'm just so nervous about what that means right now. At the moment, I'm so... <laughs> I'm so, so like I'm a so design primed, problem for I'm you, so too. I'm so primed on coordination right now that it's just... But it, it, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't still. know what to do with my hands. How do you... Know. How do you <laughs> Go outward like that. It shows you're giving. <laughs> That's right. Go like that. Um, so how do you create environments <laughs> where you know right. you're going to solicit appropriate data? Right. So, you know, I, I mean, I think one, um, one thing is to generate, you know, there's some value in generating from the data that's being produced, right? So, I mean, uh, I think in a, in a lot of these sites, you know, you, you want to figure out what is the baseline of behavior, but you have a lot of behavior in that site. Right, and so if, if I create profiles, so one thing we found, certainly found useful is this notion of typicality versus atypicality, right? Um, and actually the unusual color versus the usual color was, was an interesting thing, right? Because what was key there was it was not red cars are better, or purple cars are better, right? It's typical versus atypical, which is actually domain independent, mm -hmm. right? Because there can be typical colors, there can be typical languages, that, you know, it's typical uses of language, there can be all these things, and so I, I think that, that that's always one dimension you should look at in your users and in, in, in your data, is there's going to be a sort of center of mass in the distribution, and stuff there is going to feel comfortable, but maybe less sort of memorable, less noticeable, and then stuff further away from it. Um, that was actually, actually one other thing we did with the movie quotes, was trying to un, un, understand, can we build a statistical model of which quotes ended up having high counts on Google, right? Which quotes entered pop culture, which quotes ended up on IMDb as memorable quotes. And, and this axis of typicality and atypicality was actually very crucial, right? So we took, you know, you take the whole corpus or you take Newswire and you say, that's typical. And it turned out the memorable movie quotes, the ones that have high Google counts and the ones that are on IMDb, um, are actually atypical in their choice of words, mm -hmm. but they're very typical in their choice of part of speech. Right, so the part of speech sequence, very familiar, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then the words, you sprinkle on these unusual words, right? And so, you know, often I think that it's sort of a, a way to think about um, how to create an experience that sort of feels right. You should sort of think about where you're positioning yourself on that axis. And I guess as with the words and part of speech, they're actually, it's multidimensional, right? You should, maybe you should be typical on some things and atypical on others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We start to examine people in this collective way we never have before now. And Initially, it was somewhat private musings on the internet. People are sitting alone, you know, at a computer, mm -hmm. dreaming of a book they might have, or a date they might have, or a comment they might make, any number of presentations of the, the self. But now, we're also watching them move through space, or we're seeing purchases, or four square declarations, things they're sort of doing with other people, even mm -hmm. as they're being tagged. Does this change our sense of people as a, do we start seeing collective behavior in ways we hadn't seen before? Oh, certainly. But I think I, I'm always, I'm just going to be cautionary about what conclusions <coughs> one can make, right? So right. I think Kate gave a really nice example yesterday. Of, you know, if you look at the, the Twitter stream from New York, you know, during Sandy, will you have a set of assumptions about people's experiences? <coughs> Right. And then I think she reminded us that actually that is a collective experience of right. a particular socioeconomic group in a particular place. And there were a whole other, bunch of other people who were being affected by Sandy who were not on that channel. And so those experiences are as legitimate and we learn as much about or perhaps more about you know, the typical atypical. So the typical experience on Twitter in New York could be extracted. But is that typical of everybody's experience of Sandy? No. And so I think one of the things we've been talking about a lot here is understanding the bounds of the data set that you have. And John and I certainly chatted about that yeah. yesterday, which is understanding that you know, if you're looking at people's behavior on Facebook, that's their behavior on Facebook. And there's a lot of typical and atypical examples, and there are subclusters of kinds of behavior in different subgroups. right? And then there's all the people who aren't on Facebook. So let's not make too many assertions about human behavior in general mm -hmm. unless we do good science of trying to understand what are the, if you want the, the what's the platform and the constructs every that data set in that context. Every social data set or, or people-oriented right. data set should come with a kind of tagging of its origin and context. Right. What were they doing? What right. is the valence of this? Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, it, um, a number of people, of course, um, my colleague Tarleton, Tarleton Gillespie at Cornell and others, you know, have pointed out that this word platform, right, it's a yeah. very carefully constructed word that we're just a platform. You know, we just give you a place to stand. In. But of course, all of these are really designed social systems. And so I think there is this notion of our experience as a collective, but, you know, in, in the same way that we think about the local culture and the local sort of reference frames when you're offline, right, there's kind of a, an additional layer of, you could call it culture, really, that, 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 that happens in, the, in each of these sites. Some of it created by us and some of it created by the design nature of, of mm -hmm. the system, which all sort of, yeah, so it's certainly the case that, right, what's typical and atypical is always, and sort of, yeah, the very, the very first thing you say there is, relative to a site you're on, right? This mm -hmm. is typical behavior for that site. That's the local norms of that site. That's the kind of people who are there. And that can change as more people come online or more people yeah. come Yeah, when your grandma friends you on Facebook, you probably start posting a little differently, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you have to be aware of who else is connected in that yeah. network and has their eyes on the kind of data you're putting out. Well, it, yeah. it kind of behooves you to be aware. And I think a lot of people learn by experimentation, right? Yeah. So there's been a lot of stuff recently of you know, people tweeting things out and then being arrested. I mean, you know, there was a young woman in the UK recently. Yeah, she did a hit and run. She did a hit and run and tweeted about it and then came and got arrested. <laughs> and so, you know, you start to sort of, it, it, it's amazing, you know, how those, those behaviors will be constructed and that's on the part of the participants. It was better than she got arrested. The police <laughs> tweeted back saying, come, <laughs> come turn yourself in. <laughs> right. Right. We will go get you. Right. And uh, you know, I think in terms of the platform, it's really interesting because if you look at something like, you know, Facebook's doing a really nice job of like, reaching into lots of parts of our lives and now you can check in. And so there are permeable boundaries in a way that, you know, you used to go into the virtual world and right. it was like closed. Now there are these really interesting permeable boundaries. But we still have to have the cautionary about what we're learning and how partial that is. Because yeah, that's the thing. We sort of take this social behavior and there's a real hazard of universalizing it, isn't there? Exactly. And there's a privacy violation there. There's also a kind of heuristic violation there, isn't there? Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, the important thing to remember is that we've, this is not a new problem. It's a new incarnation of an old problem, which is that every time one runs an experiment, assembles a focus yeah. group, does a field study, does an observational study, runs a behavioral economics experiment on Caltech undergrads, right? Every time you do that, you're studying a particular population. Mm -hmm. um, and this is our particular population. And I think, right, there's a danger of sort of smugness that, well, our particular population is huge. And therefore, right, as Kate was saying, you know, the, the hugeness makes it somehow better or less idiosyncratic. But it's, it's, it's still idiosyncratic because there was a selection mechanism by which all those people ended up on this particular So in this kind of a world, do we become sort of more highly seen precise individuals with many, many contexts, or do we disappear into more and more contextual groups? Hey, both things can be true. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, you know, we also were talking yesterday about this notion of events versus processes, right? And so if you think about, you know, all of the events that I do, you believe that you kind of know me, mm -hmm. but then there are all these processes that are going on in my life, like life changes and, you know, I move house or I bump into something, and I'm changing the way I behave all of the time. And so I think it, 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 it's, it's both, and it's fluid, and people participate. How many, how many people have just decided, I'm going to take a week off social media this week? I'm just done, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, so you apparently went dark for data, right? Mm. But we don't necessarily know why, but it's interesting. But you are a high, but you know, I certainly know you're very, you know, and, and you're very connected, you're very online, you're very present. And so you chose to be not for that week. Um, I'm not, you know, tweeting or emailing or doing anything now because I'm in this social context. So I think we, we do, oh, we do, yeah. and we move in and out. I mean, I think also um, this notion that we're very aware of different contexts and people in different contexts. And, you know, I mean, sort of to, we talked about this a little bit before, the, to take sort of a 20 year long view of the development of the web and how much diversity we've seen on the web. There's been this sort of disconcerting separation of awareness from empathy, maybe, that we're aware of a lot of things that, you know, the increased awareness somehow has not necessarily caused us to care more about them or feel that. It's our problem. Say more. Um, what, do you, what, what does that it, mean to you? So, I, I mean, I guess, you know, in, this is, you know, by the nature of these 
broad brush points, someone you know should yeah. feel free to push back on it. But you know, you might have imagined that if you said, you know, did you realize, you know, in 1993 that the web's just going to keep growing? You know, this thing mosaic that you're using is just going to keep going, and um, you're going to be able to you know access news from all over the world. When an event happens, you're going to you know you're on Twitter, and you're going to see real time reactions from people all over the world with very different perspectives from your own. You know, you're going to be able to watch elections and watch people who are behind different points of view. You know, and all that's going to be at your fingertips. And you know, do you do you or do you not? guess from that, that the world will be a more kind of understanding, sympathetic place where you'll be buffeted by all these points of view and so you'll be more sympathetic to them. Well, and, you know, that somehow is the, that, that, that last bit, and maybe of course if one hadn't, you know, if one had sort of thought of it and not been naive, you would have said, well, of course. My experience may not be trivial here. I, I spent 10 years doing a show on Fox, and um, the thing about cable television is there's a reason why they're always shouting. There's a reason why they're always shocking and they're always taking extreme views, which is that it's a very, very intense competitive data environment. There are 200 cable channels. There are probably 20 or 30 news channels going anytime. You've got to hold that guy. And careful, rational, reasoned arguments among thoughtful men and women, click, yeah. you know. So if it pops, people yeah. sort of watch. And if it is dialogue that affirms their preconceptions so much the better. There's not the anxiety of being challenged. Right. So you get this kind of, in, in a world rich in data sources, you almost narrow more intensively yeah. because you just can't take on all those alternatives. So the kind of UI problem here becomes how do I introduce difference in a way that isn't massively confrontational is pleasant. Yeah. You know? So I, the sort of, one thing I always come back to, sort of in my, in my 20 years of trying to look at lack of empathy and all this, on, on the internet, there's sort of this one experience that I actually had that was different, like a, almost a singular experience that was neither about rational debate nor yelling, but the sort of third thing, which was um, when, when America Online, August 2006, released query logs accompanying a paper they just published, which was, of course, one of the, the, the famous privacy missteps of yeah. you know, the past 10 years. And so let me not talk about the privacy problems, because that's obviously been talked about a lot, but <clears throat> something else. So I was among the you know search researchers who downloaded it right away. You're like, wow, search data. Who, who, whoever yeah. gets this, right? And so you download it. And you know, probably among all the things that was in that data, the, maybe the most unusual was that they had sorted it by you know, the first key they sorted on was user, and then and then time. So you had, you had a block of one user's queries. Whereas you know, you stand in the lobby of Google, you watch stuff going up, and you think that the entire world is looking for pop song lyrics in Korean, and you know, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's not very exciting. But when, when, when you watch one person, you know, one person searching, right? And um, so I'm scrolling through, you know, I'm, you know, I type, you know, cat, whatever, pipe to less, and you're just paging through it, you know, and it's, you know, and you're maybe 20 screens down, and you start, I, I, I hit this woman, and it's, she seems to be about 20, and she has, a, it's, it's 2006, remember, so she has, her husband appears to be in Iraq, she's sort of looking at sort of, even like rental car discounts for people whose spouses are in the military, and, and she has this daughter who's probably four or five, who's, she's planning a birthday for her, so she's ordering like streamers, the daughter seems to like butterflies, like butterfly decorations for birthdays, butterfly mm -hmm. themed birthday cakes, and um, at night, you know, because of the timestamp, right, so it's like 1 a.m., she's searching for like how to be a cheerleader, a cheerleading squads in Georgia, and she lives in Georgia, and, and I, I'm reading this, and I'm like, you know, I'm getting this emotional reaction. I'm like, this is someone who has absolutely nothing in common with me, right? I mean, if I were standing behind this person in line at the store, it's like, you know. But, but I'm like, I recognize all these features of their life. You know, I also, like, late at night go, you know, I really need to, really, mm -hmm. you know, and I need to, like, plan this thing for my daughter who was about the same age. And it's, you know, so it's like, you know, it created a sense of empathy Massive that I had empathy. not you, you had. You recreated her world. Yeah, and, you know. It may have had, had nothing to, to do with their actual life. Maybe but, not, but you know. I felt, yeah, you, you feel a sense of connection. And, now, of course, in order to do that, you have to do this incredibly disruptive, destructive thing, which is, you know, this is much more personal than reading someone's email, because someone's email is designed to be read by someone, right? You've written it for someone. This is someone who never in their wildest dreams thought this was being recorded or read by anybody, right? Mm -hmm. This is them. And, and so you felt like, okay, you know, proof of concept somehow that you can create this feeling, which is neither about, I'm going to read a... 10 page treatise on the healthcare law, nor right. is it people yelling at each other, it's something else. It's some feeling connection with someone you didn't think you had anything in common with because you found this kind of common. But I mean, I think that's why I was arguing for this notion that data science involves m multiple methods and triangulation. Because, you know, if I had simply looked at the, the data from the dating sites, um, I wouldn't have gotten a, a sense of what it feels like. So we, you know, Elizabeth and I did, I don't know, I, you know. 50 interviews or something, and then we went out and actually did 26 face-to-face -face interviews. 
And we actually hung out with people as they were getting ready for dates and coming back from dates. And mm -hmm. we went to their favorite kinds of places. And we had chosen, so we did you know, good research. We actually looked at the particular group and we selected the particular group we wanted to focus on. So we had clear questions. And we went in to talk to that group and we looked at the typicalities and atypicalities with respect to the rest of the literature, with respect to this group and our expectations. And we did ethnographic fieldwork. And we watched the emotions and the feelings and that was about generating empathy. And I have mm. found, um, you know, to triangulate the data you see, which might be in the aggregate, aggregate with the particularities of a group that is selected and individuals, and how they are actually walking through this life that you're seeing the shadows of. I always talk about data traces as sort of the shadows of a life. Mm -hmm. You're looking mm. at the shadows. Then you start to go and paint out the picture and start to see what's typical and atypical by having <coughs> enough people in your sample that you start to, the moment you stop having questions is when you know you've kind of learned enough of the shape. Yeah. And but taking, uh, taking designer developers out and data scientists out who have seen people through the conversational traces or the online shadows and actually teaching them how to do good ethnographic field work really builds a sense of empathy. Right. From, from recent, but then the question is, how do we put that back in the system? Right? You, yeah, you, how do you, you could say, why that it maybe it's a very hard empathy. problem, but it has certainly been a failure of all these sites that they Absolutely. are not creating that sense of connection. It, maybe it's undoable on the internet, but so it I, certainly has not happened. Right? I think there's two ways to put it back into the system, and that's why I think we're at the start of data science, right? which is you can put it back into the system by being really clear about your instrumentation and by having um, data scientists and designers work together so that any time you design an interface, any designer should be able to say to you, this is why this artifact exists on this interface. It exists for this purpose and for this experience to be had. And I'm expecting that this button will be pressed once every six months, but when it is pressed, it's really important. So you build in the hypotheses and we build in the, the ways to look at data, the, the, um, the probes or whatever, the beacons, if you like, for behavior. Um, and I think generating that sensibility, which is not about having the interfaces necessarily just a set of instrumental transactions, but actually about the experiences that the person is likely to have, is that it, it, that's where I think the rubber hits the road for us to start to really build a data design science and a design of data science. Yeah. And that's when I think we'll start being able to look at our interfaces and say, um, actually, ethically or unethically, what we, would, what we think this is giving people is the following. And so I'm trying to stay a little instrumental, but just bump it up one. But then I think the question of ethics comes next. Yeah. And I, I should say, actually, after the, you know, essentially, you know, as soon as I downloaded this and started reading these query logs, I was like, I'm not using this data because, and I think the, 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 the community mainly felt like we're not using this data because it was, you know, it was sort of obtained in a way that was, you know. You don't know how intimate and vulnerable this data actually was. It Somebody was, right. had to look at it and go. Someone had to say, no, this is, yeah. This has a different character. This was not, this was not released with. Has ethical right, issues. It was not released with anyone's consent. And it was just, you know, and it, it, was, it was clear from it, right? It was, you know. Interesting. Uh, shall we take questions for a couple of minutes? Questions from the audience? Go. I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, uh, okay. Unless you want to wait for the microphone. I'm, I'm very intrigued by the discussion. And we're sort of. Sort of, we're highlighting a lot of the limitations and sort of pitfalls of working with the social media data and whatnot. And Elizabeth is pushing us to add ethnography back. So I'm curious. We had a first panel of people who are really focused on using more and more data and getting better and better algorithms to sort out that data and to solve problems like you know finance or whatever. How would you speak to them about the pitfalls of what they're doing, or is that just are you just talking across past one another? Um, I would say, have at it. <laughs> because whatever you're learning, I think, is important. And just be critical, in, in the true sense of critical, which is, when you're disappointed, let us know. You know, we used to, like, when I, when I was still working in academia, we used to have this whole thing that we wanted the journal of, you know, non-significant results. Um, and I think one of the problems that we're having right now is the um, aggrandizing of data science in a sort of defensive way of it's all glorious. And I think we need um, honesty about what doesn't work and acceptance of, if I come up and say to the gentleman earlier, you know, here's a question I have, can you answer that? And to have an honest answer, well, we could answer this facet of it, but not that. 
I think is extremely useful. And, and, and so have at it, but be honest and talk, talk really. That's it. I know a guy in Boston who collects, um, on behalf of many, many scientists around the world, um, histories of failed experiments, yeah. because that's where the learning took place. Yeah. You know, yeah. the results, the, the, the successful one has the least amount of learning in it, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, the, I, I think that there actually are very close connections. I mean, what was all the stuff going on in the discussion this morning was fantastic. And not actually that far from, you know, what we talked to, you know, I mean, if you look at what is the back end of a dating site that does the matching process, what is the back end of a friend recommendation site, or all of these are, you know, all of these are collecting huge numbers of signals, are co collecting data that's very wide, has very, very many features. I think that's going to be in, inevitable because if we, you know, if we throw stuff out upstream, we have no way to make use of it later on. I think if there's anything we're learning from these very subtle social signals, the kind of you know, signals people present about themselves in dating sites, the kind of low-level language signals, it it's exactly comes back to this point that what we think of as a sort of small set of things that we attend to is actually maybe a composite of a very large, very complicated set of low-level signals that we're attending to, right? And, and so I think we always make a mistake, you know, certainly now speak as a computer scientist, as, as computer scientists, that you know, we, the, our first take on the problem is to sort of impose our human intuitions and say, we're going to define the problem this way. Whenever you open the problem out and flatten it, say, you know, let, let's go back, let's just collect everything. And then we'll, new, new things happen in important ways, right? And so I think there has to be that feedback loop where that, that happens, and then we have domain experts, right, who interpret it. I mean, I, I tend to think of, you know, when you think about sort of what's special with this, you know, notion of big data, it's really, it's the complex algorithms and data at scale, and in the context of a domain where the team includes people who understand it. And it, it needs to have, have that feedback loop. But the, yeah, all of the, I think all of that works together. Another question? I think we can take one or two more. Yes, sir. Very brief one question to John. Uh, you're going to recover the real friend network. Uh, how would you do it? You do not have ground truth. You don't right. really know who are your friends. Right, so yeah, I mean, that was why my, well, one of my three questions on that slide which is the real friend network, the answer is they're all the real friend network, right? So I think it, in some sense it, uh, we don't have ground truth because there is no, right, what your friend network is, you know, in, in a work context, you want to know who your coworkers are and you want to know who you interact with, even if you wouldn't think of them as friends. In some other context, you want to think about other definitions of friendship. So uh, I feel like it's not so much about that as about recognizing context, right? So people are online at any given point for a particular purpose, for something they're trying to do. And in that context, there's a certain set of people they're going to interact with, right? That's, that's certainly how you, how you behave in your offline life. And I think you'd want the online, online domain to mirror that, right? I mean, that's yet another one of these inversions where, you know, in the 1950s, you know, you, you look at early social network analysis, you know, you look at Anatole Rappaport, you look at people like this, and, um, you know, they're trying to convince the world that these dots and lines have some meaning. That yes, yes, we understand we've thrown away a lot, but it, it's somehow, it's, it's useful. It's, and, 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 and somehow there's been this complete inversion of things where now we design systems, we say, okay, step one, you just signed up, build your profile, let's assemble your network, right? The network has now become the thing we build in, not the thing we kind of stand back and, and use to represent. And so I think, I think we have to remember that we need to enrich that, that, that picture because there is no one set of friends, right? There's different contexts and different things. Hi, uh, thanks. This has been really great, and I've loved this. I want to kind of continue on this on this thread and and ask about sort of we've been talking a lot about sort of the data scientists and and the concerns and and the 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 work on that level. But I'm wondering sort of who pays for all of this and what they expect and sort of I because I've seen a lot of times where you'll have a, a you know a data scientist who will say yes yeah there are sort of all these multiple things, but Maybe I'm wondering sort of the context in which these are placed where someone expects there to be one real social network and like how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we speak to, to those people who expect, I guess, more from, or different things from data science? Who, who are you talking of when you say those people? Well, I guess in, the, in a variety of contexts it can be sort of uh, everything from, the, you know, if we're talking about tracking a Twitter storm or something, the media or the public that expects a certain kind of a uh, uh, bit of information, or if we're talking about uh, you know context in a business, or in sort of just everything from supply chain management to like health practices, 
uh, if we want to sort of reform or make cities smart, things like that, like we've, we've heard Somebody a lot has about. a large store of data, they're looking for a certain kind of outcome. Right, they yeah. want a ground truth. Person. They want something that is where there is only one real social network that they can track. I mean, I, 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 I can't quite imagine a, that world somehow, because I think that the world will continually fragment and fragment. And I think, I think that starts to abut against some of the privacy concerns, which I'm distinctly trying to stay away from, because I think it's a big rat hole, a very important rat hole, but not one I want to go down. But I, I can imagine, you know, NSA wanting one big network. <laughs> But I certainly don't have an inroad there. Um. Well, I think it's, I have no doubt Yahoo or Google aspires to have one big network. Well, it, I think there's it's aspirations, be, but yeah, whether it's, it's going to be, be achievable or not. It's going to be a multifaceted network. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, some other way to picture, I mean, I actually picture, you know, you've got this high dimensional point cloud, right? We reach a point in that space. And there are different ways you want to segment it for different purposes, right? So one business has one objective function and says, oh, we should tilt the data this way and find the highest point because that's our objective function. And some other thing, someone says, oh, no, we should rotate this way and find the highest point because right. that's our objective. Right. So, you know, the, the way you segment people, if you're trying to mail them catalogs for cruise vacations, is going to be different from the way you segment them if you're trying to mail them, you know, um, you're trying to do direct marketing of political campaigns on the Democratic or Republican side. Because people segment in very different ways. So it, it would sort of be like asking, can't we just have one segmentation once and for all that solves everything? But of course not, because each, each, each firm, each company, each political campaign, they all, they all have a different objective function, right? And so even on the same data set, different clusterings, different segmentations, different ways of assessing value are going to actually be different. So I think, you know, for any one of these firms, you would say, we need to understand your particular objective, and then that's how we'll project the data. But we shouldn't project first and then shop it around because different people want different things. I can imagine a world, you know, way down the line where, you know, census information, for example. So, like, global governmental census information might be a place where everybody in the world is recorded somehow. But the ways in which, to John's point, they become part of a network and the extent to which they're part of one or multiple networks and how much we know about them, I think, is going to be hugely varying. And, and I think even now, going in, we... We've got a very rich network on something like Facebook, but there's still a whole bunch of stuff about people I know on Facebook that even if I were a data engineer at Facebook, I probably don't know about them, do you know? There are huge gaps. Um, and so I think John's point is good. I can imagine like everybody in the world becoming an, a registered node through some global census, <laughs> but what you then do with that and how you represent them in any kind of network, I think is... But even then, valuable. they'd know they were inside. I mean, as with every human activity that's tagged and they know it's tagged, there is this uncertainty problem. Right. They're, yeah. they're gaming it to some that's extent because right. they know they're in a context. That's right. Yeah. But I think why your, well, your question is very important is, you know, I, I put up that triangle with the sort of regulatory down to the micro the user and the sort of like the blunt end to the sharp end, if you want, where my sharp end is, you know, people and their behaviors. I think your question is really important because of what you're posing is that we both within an organization and we ask of organizations, what is it that you're collecting and why? And what is it that you want to collect strategically and why? And is that set of desires and enactments ethical and something we as a society want to sign up for or not? So I think that behind your question, there are some really interesting social and ethical questions as well as technical and business questions. Right. Um, and you know, one can imagine business metrics changing around right. how a company is valued right. and all of these things. And I think these are the supremely interesting questions. Um, yeah. And from a science point of view, you know, again to John's point earlier, you know, we used to run experiments and we used to have all of these caveats. You know, I did lab experiments on caveats about what can you conclude from this group and this, this set of behaviors I've observed and these dependent and independent variables are all very carefully laid out. And I think it's really exciting because we're only right at the beginning of just the science, never mind the ethics. Yeah. Last word. It, you know, I think even one thing we were talking about uh, yesterday was even within you know, one organization, the consequences of your decisions are often hard to figure out, right? So you know, at, at, at Google, you can ask, what actually is your goal? Is it to get people to find high quality search results, to click on ads right now, to want to come back to the site a month later, a year later? You might actually optimize for different things under all these objectives. So I think even within one organization, 
the question of what are you trying to do with your data is complicated and, and can, can, can be hard to assess. And I totally agree we're at the threshold of a lot of exciting things, including things we didn't really even manage to talk about, like massive experimentation, massive you know, randomized trials and, and, and users. And I think all of, that, all of that's coming and very exciting. Well, we'll just have to take it outside for coffee and hash it all out there. That's good. Thank you so much. Let's get our Thanks. Thank you.